بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are still studying the chapter that deals with jihad in our series on Umdatul Ahkam and hadith number 402 Hadith of Sahil ibn Sa'd al-Sa'idi, may Allah be pleased with him. Who would read it for us? Yes, the brother at the end. Narrated Sahil ibn Sa'd al-Sa'idi, Allah's Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, To be in watch for one day in Allah's cause is better than the world and whatever is on its surface. And a place in paradise of one's writ is better than the world and whatever is on its surface. And a morning on a evening's journey which a slave travels in Allah's cause is better than the world and whatever is on its surface. So this hadith of Sahal ibn Sa'ad al-Sa'idi, may Allah be pleased with him, highlights the importance of not only jihad, but also to anticipate and to watch in the cause of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because we have two types, either actual combat, actual fighting, or guarding in the cause of Allah. And this is usually taking place at the borders. When you have the army here and the army there, there's no combat, they're waiting, they're anticipating, but nothing happens. Maybe it takes one day, a week, a month, a year, and they are anticipating at the borders. This is for the cause of Allah. Then the Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, one, to be in watch for one day, in Allah's cause is better than the world and whatever is on its surface. Now, if you contemplate and ponder on this, you would blow your mind away. Why? The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, explaining that the place in paradise of one's whip is better than the world and whatever is on its surface. A whip that you use for your camels or for your ride, you will have one in paradise. But are you using it to beat someone with it? No. It's part of the luxury of paradise. And everything that is in paradise does not share anything which we have except the name. So in paradise there is gold. In this life we have gold. Is there any similarity? None whatsoever. To the extent that a whip, which is something that has no value, the Prophet says that the whip in paradise is the place where it's put on the floor, on the ground, is more valuable and better and more beautiful than the whole earth and what's on the surface of that earth. To that extent, so it has no resemblance to what we know. It's something that we cannot imagine. In paradise, Allah Azza wa has prepared for his servants what no eye has seen, no ear has heard of, and it did not cross anyone's heart. Never. Therefore, the Prophet is telling us, salam, that this, what you would be watching and guarding for one day, only it is better than the whole of earth. Why? Because the reward is in paradise. And look what the reward of a whip is equivalent to. And not only that, the Prophet is telling us, alayhi salam, that Al-Ghudwa wa rawha What is that? Al-Ghudwa is translated here roughly an evening's travel. So this is Ghudwa or an evening travel. And this is Rawha. This short period of time, two hours, three hours, also the Prophet tells us, alayhi salam, when you do it for the sake of Allah, when it is in jihad, it is better than the whole world and what's on earth. Why? Because this is in the cause of Allah and jihad has the highest level of good deeds. As we will come, inshallah, to mention afterwards. The Prophet said in the hadith that jihad is the top of religion. Dhurwatu salam The salam of a camel, the hump on a camel's back. It is the highest thing. So the Prophet is telling us that jihad is the hump of the whole of Islam, it's the top. Without it, Islam would be weak, the Muslims would be humiliated, and 
nothing would happen in accordance to the Quran and Sunnah because there is no jihad. Moving on to the following hadith, hadith number 403. Yes, Sahih. Narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, Allah's Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah guarantees him who goes out in his cause and whose motivation for going out is nothing but jihad in my cause. Believing in me and believing in my messenger, I guarantee him that I will admit him into paradise if martyred or bring him back to his dwelling place that he came out from with what he gains of reward and booty. Okay, now this hadith highlights a guarantee. And this guarantee is from Allah Azza wa Jal. What is this guarantee? Allah Azza wa Jal guarantees for those who go out of their homes for the sake of Allah and nothing else. That Allah Azza wa Jal either would give them paradise or would return them back to their home or an addition with the booty of the war because this is one of the three cases. Either you die as a martyr and you end up in paradise. End of story. Or you come back without any booty, without any wealth, but you come back with the reward. And this doesn't mean that you come back safe. Maybe you're injured. Maybe you have sustained something that is permanent in battle. But the same thing that you are rewarded in paradise. Or Allah would return you back with some of the booty of the war. And this is why a lot of the scholars differed in regards of mixed intentions. If someone goes for jihad, knowing that he will gain some financial means, is this permissible or not? It's an issue of dispute. If the main intention was for worldly matters, then this is not for the sake of Allah. But if the main intention is for the sake of Allah and knowing that this would result and come out of it, this is permissible. Example, person goes to Hajj. What is your reason for going to Hajj? I'm going there simply to gain something of this world. I don't have intention for Allah Azza wa Jal. Then you're sinful. A person goes to Hajj, but he has the intention of trading as well. Yet his main intention is for Hajj. Then this other intention is a benefit and a gift from Allah. Allah says in the Quran, لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَبْتَغُوا فَضْلًا مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ And this is in Hajj. There is nothing wrong in you trading and seeking Allah's grace over you through trading during Hajj. There is no problem in that. Now the intention is very important. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu was salam, the first to be thrown into hell on the day of judgment are a martyr, a knowledgeable person, and someone who spent his money in the cause of charity. And all of them, when Allah shows them his favors and blessing upon them and asks them, what did you do? The martyr says, I fought in your cause, O Allah. And Allah says, you're a liar. You fought so that people would say you're brave. Take him to hell. Likewise, a man asks the Prophet about the types of jihad. So I fight so that people are acknowledging me as being brave. I fight because all of my people are fighting, so I'm with them. And it's called hamiyya, it's called in Arabic. Because they're fighting, I'm fighting with them. Not that I'm brave, not that I love the cause, but I cannot be left behind. A person fights for al maghnam the money. There is booty of war, I can get me three tanks, or I get this or that. Money. Who is it in the cause of Allah? And the Prophet said, whoever fights so that the word of Allah is superior, then he is in the cause of Allah. All of these three are not in the cause of Allah. So this hadith highlights that Allah guarantees for those who go and fight for the sake of Allah, Allah guarantees paradise for them if they're martyred. Or if they go back, 
they have the reward waiting for them in paradise, or at least they will go back again with some of the booty and the treasures they get from and through this war. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and we, inshallah, be right back. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So, if you want to study fiqh alone, pure, you go to the Hanbali school of thought, the Shafi'i, the Hanafi, the Maliki, and select one of the summarized books of fiqh. It tells you water is divided into three parts, tahur, tahir, najis, and they move on without mentioning to you where did they get this from, what's the evidence behind it. They only tell you that this is halal haram and move on. But this is not the right way of studying fiqh, though it is one part. For a beginner, it's good that he goes through one school of thought, summarized book. Now, for those like you and me who are interested only in the things that please Allah. Okay, this book of fiqh does not please Allah. It might be, it might not. Because I don't know if this is what Allah Azza wa revealed or not. I don't know if this is what the Prophet Azza wa taught or not. I believe that 80% of it is authentic, it's right. But 20% may not be based on authentic evidence. So they follow another school of thought, and that is the school of thought of Hadith. And this school of thought, definitely all the scholars, the great scholars, they are followers of a particular madhab. But they do not let their madhab come first. They let the Quran and Sunnah come first, following it through the guidelines of their madhab. And this hadith or this book is an illustration. If you open the book, you'll find that it's 420 plus hadiths. And it's all based under chapters. What do you mean by chapters? Fiqh is based under chapters. Hadith usually is based under either chapters of fiqh or narrators. So like the books of Musnad, Musnadul Imam Ahmad, it's divided into narrators. So you have the Musnad of Abu Bakr, the Musnad of Umar, all the hadiths that Umar narrated, it's in one chapter. Then he moves to Abu Huraira. Then you have Aisha, you have Anas. So regardless whether it's on fiqhi uh, subjects or not, no. But this is what he narrated. May Allah be pleased with him, the companion. In the books of fiqh, based on hadith, no. They all begin with purity. They all begin with water, the types of water, utensils, because this is what you carry water in. And then they move into the second pillar of Islam, which is salat, prayer. So why did they start with water? Why did they start with utensils? Why did they start with uh, water, uh, skins, types of skins? Because at the time, the water containers were made of what? Skin. So what kind of skin is permissible for me to put water? And what is the use of that? Because this is related to the second pillar. The first pillar deals with aqidah. It's not our topic. Al-Kalima, the Kalima, deals with the books of aqidah. Here we focus on fiqh. So we begin with tahara. And this includes menses of women, menstruation. And this includes wudu, includes ghusl, includes purifying your clothes your body, after answering the call of nature, how do you purify yourself? All of this is an introduction to prayer. Then they move to prayer, the second pillar of Islam. And they talk about the five prayers. They talk about the voluntary prayers. They talk about the uh, uh, prayers that are the Eidain, the Khusuf, uh, Kusuf, the Eclipse, asking Allah for water. And before all of that, they talk about timings. Mawaqeet. How do I know that the time of the prayer starts now or later? You have to identify this. And they go on until they finish everything related to prayer. How to pray it, prayer in congregation, forgetfulness, sujood, prostration, and a lot of things. Then they move to the third, fourth, and fifth uh, pillars of Islam regarding fasting, zakat, and hajj. 
After we finish, which is the most important thing for us to learn. Why? Because Allah created us to do what? To do what? To worship Him. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون. I have not, Allah says, created the jinn and the humans except to worship me. This is His command. Some may worship Him, some may not. Those who worship Him will go to paradise, those who refuse will go to hell. So, the book that deals with the five pillars of Islam is called the book of Ibadat. Not that anything else is not part of worshiping Allah, but they're calling the forms of worship, the pillars of Islam, to be forms of worship. And then they move on to the book of transactions, Al-Mu'amalat. These are the categorization of fiqh books. And they start usually with buyur, sales. What is permissible for you to sell? What is not permissible for you to sell? What is haram to deal with such as riba, such as najash? And we will go to all of this inshallah. To sell blindly, to buy without naming the price, anything that has disputes. Why? They said because if you prayed and learned how to worship Allah, you need to eat. And you cannot eat without buying. So they talk a lot about transactions, how to deal with others, how to sell in gold and silver, what is riba, what is interest, what are the types of forbidden forms of buying and selling. And then after that, some of them move and talk about food. Because we have food, we know how to buy food, what to do? I'd like to know the foods, and this means the types of slaughtering, the types of haram food, the types of things that I can consume and things I cannot. And then, after a person has prayed and learned his deen and bought something and filled his stomach with, what would he think usually about? Marriage. So they talk about marriage, how to propose, how to get married, how to get divorced. After you get divorced, how to have idda, the waiting period. And they move on and on and on. And usually these things lead to fights, disputes. So they talk about chapters dealing with blood, talking about injuries, talking about murders, prescribed uh, punishment in Islam. So everything is connected. Now, Islam is huge, but it is simple. Because it's from Allah, because it's from our Creator, it is extremely simple. And as we, inshallah, will go through this great book, you will find that it is extremely simple for all of us to learn. However, this is, as I've said, for the beginners. So if you master this book, you're entitled, inshallah, to go to stage two. And usually, scholars say that stage two is the book of Bulugh al-Maram which was compiled by Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. May Allah have mercy on his soul. See, the beauty of hadith and the beauty of fiqh and the beauty of knowledge to students of knowledge is that the more knowledgeable they are, the more appreciative they are to the other schools of thought and respectful they are to the other scholars. We have a few minutes left, so we open the floor for any question related to the topic, inshallah, or a little bit off the topic is no problem. If I have the answer, I will answer it, inshallah. If I don't, I'll simply say, Allahu A'lam. So who'd like to go for the first question? Yes, brother. Uh, Sheikh, you mentioned that those ahadiths that which deal with halal and haram, that is the jurisprudence, does not include the adab. So is that the case that the adab, the manners, does not include the halal and the haram adab? Well, the halal and haram adabs definitely have to be mentioned there. For example, one would say, eating with my left hand or drinking with my left hand. What's the ruling on that? It's halal or haram. The majority say it is makruh. And the most authentic opinion, it is forbidden. So by etiquette, we meant to say that when entering a house, 
How many times should you ask for permission? Three times. The Sunnah is to say, Assalamu alaikum, adkhul, may I come? Three times, nobody answers, you leave. So these are part of the etiquettes that usually the books of fiqh, especially these uh, summarized versions, do not mention. It is mentioned in the widely expanded books. Why? Because it comes through this process and they collect anything that deals with uh, these things, even makruh or mustahab. And Allah knows best. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu uh, Shaykh, as you said that we should respect the scholars who have difference of opinion. But uh, how to deal with those people who say that uh, even after we show them a hadith, they say, no, our school of thought says this, our school of thought says that. So how do you deal with those people? Well, it depends on their ability. And we always have to judge people in accordance to their ability, not to ours. So if I go to someone who is unable to walk for 10 meters without resting, it is unfair for me to ask him to jog for a kilometer. His ability does not take him. It's, it's wrong for me to go to someone whose job description does not have or does not include solving problems. And I tell him, I have a problem, do this, do that, something that's complicated. These people you're talking about usually have a limitation. They say and they believe. I only follow my school of thought because if I go a little bit higher, I'm confused and I may reject Islam. A'udhu Billah. Why? He says, listen, there's so many differences. I'm unable to know. You have to look at the ability. Yes, if this individual whom I'm telling him, the hadith is authentic. And he says, I agree. I know Sahih al-Bukhari is authentic, but I don't want to follow it. I want to follow my madhab or my imam. This person is ignorant. Pray for him and don't waste your time with him. But if someone is unable to distinguish what's right and wrong, so always remind him, try to bring him to the authentic platform of Quran and Sunnah and tell him, okay, if you don't know, this is what Allah said in the Quran. And if you dispute in anything, return it back to Quran and to the Sunnah. If he agrees and complies, Alhamdulillah, by time he will. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have until we meet next time fi amanillah wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh